All right. Chapter 36. I'm just going to be a bit quiet because my cousin's sleeping. Every morning, Rachel's in the hospital by 8.30. She wakes early these days. Her room is dim, and a gray light slips under the window shade. She turns over but cannot find the space to end her sleep again. She gets up, dresses, packs her knapsack with fruit, sandwiches, books, a hairbrush, and her journal. She leaves the house, takes a bus to the hospital. She knows the quickest way to Izzy's room. Louise, a big, cheerful nurse, calls like a jaunty Carson, like a jaunty Carson. Here's Rachel. When she walks into Izzy's room, he says, with a mixture of disapproval, he doesn't think she ought to be skipping school either, and relief, you're here again. Bad penny, bad penny, Grandpa. She kisses him, refills his water glass, opens the curtains, finds a music station on the little portable radio that Manny brought with him. That's the start of her days in the hospital. Izzy's day starts hours. Izzy's day started hours ago. It's not a calm and quiet thing to be a sick person. He's already been down x-rays this morning. Down to x-ray this morning. He's already tired out. He lies on the bed, his eyes fluttering. His hands look white, clean, bony. His breath is fast and shallow. He's sitting up, struggling to spit. Phlegm, struggling for each breath. All morning he sleeps and wakes, sleeps and wakes, and each time he wakes, he checks the oxygen mask, his fingers spraying, his fingers playing over the plastic to make sure it's in place. When he takes it off to sip water, his skin tightens with fear, and he quickly pushes it back on. Around eleven o'clock, Martin comes in to give Izzy a breathing treatment. Uh, Rachel, could you just step out? What's that privacy for? What's so private about a breathing treatment? She doesn't say it. She waits sheepishly in the hallway. She's not in charge. Izzy's not in charge either. It's his life, his body, but... He has almost no say. Almost nothing to say about it anymore. He has changed. His gruff command of the world is gone. Now he waits with the ag now he waits with the eager, anxious eyes of a boy for the words of the nurses and the doctors. Standing in the hall, waiting for Martin to finish, Rachel remembers the way Izzy came into the hospital, weak but on his feet. A man living with an illness. Now he's become a patient. And a patient is unlike anyone else. Maybe it's like the difference between army life and civilian life. Only more so. There is no place in life for a soldier for free will. Nor is there a place in life like that for a patient. The hospital staff are supreme commanders. Izzy wakes at their prodding. He eats their food at their time. He takes their pills, submits to their tests and questions, sits up and lies down at their suggestion. Of course, there is no surgeon, sergeant as there is in the army. And really, everyone is very kind, but it's the kindness of healthy and young for the old and the sick. They speak to him in loud, carrying voices, as if age and illness have affected not just his heart and lungs, but also his ears. 
In some ways, this is what Rachel finds hardest to bear. To hear Izzy spoken to as if he's a... As if he's a deficient child. No. What's hardest to bear is that he's allowing it to happen. She wants him to bark back. To say something sharp and edgy. To let the commanders of the sick corpse know that he's more than a humble foot soldier who willingly and eagerly takes their orders. What she wants, really, is for him to be the way he's always been. Dr. Greenbow is in now. Good morning, Mr. Shapiro. Doctor, how am I doing? You're doing fine, Mr. Shapiro. We've got a little procedure here to do, okay? She smiles at him, turns to Rachel. Would you mind leaving us for a couple of minutes? Rachel wants to know what the little procedure is. Dr. Greenbow is brisk. If I tell you now, I'm just going to have to tell your parents again later. So, why don't we just get this over with and let them ex- and let me explain it to them when they come. She pulls the curtain around Izzy's bed. In the hall, Rachel walks up and down. She hears, Hello, dear, at one dear, at one door groans at another. She walks quickly, burning off energy, but not enough. She runs down the four flights of stairs into the lobby, buys a pack of gum in the gift shop, runs back up the stairs. As soon as her parents show up, Izzy tells them, Dr. Greenball, that little one who looks like she should still be in school, says I'm doing fine. I suppose she knows what she's talking about. Why, Dad? The smaller they come, the smarter they are, Manny says, and they all laugh and look at Rachel. Later, when Izzy's supper is delivered, Shirley says, Now look at this! Stringy turkey, canned peas, and instant mashed potatoes. This is not a food service. This is a garbage patrol. And again, they all burst out laughing. In the hospital, Rachel notices, things strike as funny that wouldn't in the outside world. But maybe, she thinks, the next day, when Dr. North shows up, that's because so much doesn't strike you as funny. So many things that you wouldn't want to hear. So much that's so unpleasant and difficult and false. Dr. North sits on the edge of Izzy's bed, asks a few questions, reads the chart, chats to Izzy about a basketball game he saw the night before. When can I go home, doctor? Rachel looks out the window. Why does her grandfather ask this? Why is his voice light, hopeful? We have to stabilize your breathing, Mr. Shapiro. He takes out his steth ah, stethoscope, listening to Izzy's chest. And when will that be? And when will that be? Dr. North rubs Izzy's arm. Oh, I'm sure it won't be long. Later, at supper, a nurse says to Izzy, Honey, you didn't eat much. You have to keep eating to keep up your strength. Can you keep think of something else you'd like? Izzy turns his head away. His voice is low. Nothing, thank you. I have no hunger. I have no desire. Nothing.